Mr. President, uh, I mean uh, Gary Jacobs, who I hope is uh, is on uh, World um, Academy of Art and uh, Science trustees and fellows, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the session on strategies for enhancing peace, democracy, rule of law, and multilateralism in the framework of the WAAS at 64. It is my great privilege to be a fellow of this unique institution, which boasts as its founders some of the most outstanding minds humankind has produced. And we're fortunate that this tradition of intellectual excellence of thought that leads to action is continued today by Mr. Gary Jacobs, president and CEO of WAS, the intellectual engine of the academy, leading a large cohort of outstanding fellows. I wish to add my congratulations to our organization on its 64th birthday and wish it success in identifying ideas that lead to an improvement of the state of the world as we have it today. Indeed, anniversaries are a time for celebration, but also for assessments and introspection, particularly when there is precious little to celebrate. The search for effective strategies requires a precise identification of the problems. To say that the world is in transition would be a gross understatement and a naive simplification. What we're living today is not a routine changing environment, rather a pivotal moment, a change of eras, which occurs only every century or so, with the emergence of a new social and economic paradigm. In historic terms, its beginning can formally be dated with precision, the end of the Cold War. Yet the end of an ideological standoff, even the disappearance of a major empire, a change of eras does not make. This slow motion transition has been acquiring the features of an epochal change for three decades now, and it has yet to run its course. Today, well into the third decade of the 21st century and of the third millennium, which in Kofi Annan's vivid words, the world had entered through a gate of fire, humanity faces increasingly complex challenges. The return of war is a tool of choice, if not of first resort, armed conflicts threatening millions, the dismantling of disarmament commitments, a climate crisis wreaking havoc around the world, dire poverty in large parts of the world, refugee flows at record levels, rampant inequality both among and within countries, sky-high debt, threats to the rule of law, attacks on the media and civil society, growth in nationalist and isolationist politics of fear and resentment, the game-changing role of artificial intelligence and its potentially sinister side, the burgeoning role of, of technology and uh, social media in international affairs, and an absolutely abysmal state of relations among the world's most powerful countries. As a result, we're on the edge of a precipice. Where do we go from here? The World Academy of Art and Science is eminently qualified to make a major contribution to the search for answers. In this, the Academy as a preeminent civil society grouping contributes towards the same critical goals that the international community will be discussing at the summit of the future this fall. This summit, in addition to its other objectives, is the UN Secretary General's valiant attempt to mobilize the will of the member states of the organization and to help jumpstart the one sine qua non condition for progress towards these goals, a change of mindset on the part of the member states towards multilateralism. These uh, forced and unforced errors have brought our world today to a situation where the world, in the words of the Secretary General, is broken, and we collectively aim to contribute to its fixing. To this end, the Academy has organized this unique conference that will stretch over several days and involve some of the brightest minds of our time in search of solutions. As part of this effort, we have an outstanding panel today that is sure to make a significant contribution. And it is my daunting task and great privilege to introduce the speakers of this session and moderate the segment. Let me invite this, uh, to speak and briefly present them in the order they are listed in the program. They all have bios that are too rich to be presented in full here, so I will only be giving a thumbnail sketch for each. 
I'd like to start with Dr. Augusto Lopez Claros, Executive Director and Chair, Global Governance Forum, uh, who is an international economist with over 30 years of experience in international organizations, including most recently at the World Bank and before that at the uh, International Monetary Fund, uh, both in Washington, D.C. Dr. Lopez Claros has written and lectured extensively on a wide range of topics in this field. He has a degree in mathematical statistics from uh, Cambridge University in England and a PhD in economics from Duke University in the United States. And I wish to ask him to lead off the discussion. Dr. Lopez Claros, please. Um, thank you very much, David, for your very nice introductory remarks and also for your uh, kind introduction. Um, I wanted very much to um, uh, congratulate the organizers and I especially like the focus that this event is going to put on solutions and strategies. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to begin by so making a point that perhaps will be obvious to, to most people in the audience, which is that you know most of the problems that we face today, um, climate change and, and its consequences, the renewal of, of the arms race, uh, the unraveling of our nuclear order, um, the malignant uses of you know technologies and, and science, uh, poverty and equality and so on. That all of these problems, you know, do have this feature that they are global in nature and that they will only be solved in a context of much stronger levels of international cooperation. In fact, we have already noted that what has happened over the last uh, many decades is that as the global, uh, uh, as, the, as the world has become more complex, um, and because the human institutions that we have to deal with these uh, with these uh, uh, global problems have not adapted themselves to the pace of change, we see increasingly something that is called a governance gap, an inability, inability of the institutions to address these global problems because of this increasing complexity. And so this has in turn generated several strands of debate. One of them, um, to which perhaps uh, David already alluded to in some fashion in his introductory remarks, essentially says, you know, that reforms uh, at this particular moment in, in our history are a non-starter, that because of a very toxic geopolitical environment that we face today, um, we are not likely to, to be successful in in advancing a reform agenda, you know, that will get us to a better place. Um, implicit in this argument is the idea that maybe time is on our side, that we can continue to model through for the next several decades in the hope that at some point either these problems will go away or they will be resolved by, you know, some miracle, you know, for instance, some uh, unforeseen techno techno technological innovation that might help us to address the issue of climate change. My own view is that we need to actually be much more proactive. We need to uh, innovate. We need to, you know, within the existing system, there are many things that we can do which would allow us to solve uh, or to at least go some way towards finding solutions to these problems. Or, and we certainly need to have a deeper exploration of the foundations of our current system. You know, what kinds of government uh, governance system do we think would be consistent, not just with our survival as a species, but also create the conditions for the full development of our capacities, and that gives opportunity to all, and that leaves no one behind. And so it is in this context that I want to share with you a few additional thoughts as to the kinds of thing, thinking that I think would be helpful as we focus on, 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 on solutions to some of these problems. Um, the environmental risks of catastrophe are perhaps the most threatening and the least managed uh, at the moment, despite a multiplicity of multilateral environmental agreements. As you know, the Paris Agreement of 2015 is not working. Emissions have continued to rise. Uh, 
the the commitments that were made in that under that agreement were voluntary and in any case if you even if you add them up they're not consistent with uh, maintaining temperatures within a one and a half to two degrees threshold so it seems to me that going forward we may have to give serious thought to the possibility of giving the united nations the capacity to pass binding legislation to protect our our planetary environmental system and the and the common goods it provides with the necessary enforcement and dispute settlement mechanisms this seems like a tall order but nothing else seems to be working in terms of addressing you know the underlying risks of climate change and the scientific community is increasingly alarmed at the lack of progress and for the first time you know you see scientists you know speaking of impending calamities in coming in coming years and and decades and so um something that 30 40 years ago would have seemed uh, inconceivable which is to give an organ such as the united nations the ability at least in the area of the environment to pass binding legislation is increasingly talked about as one possible way out of this quandary in which we find ourselves. A second point has to do with, again, the UN, because it is the one um, institution that brings together, um, you know, 193 member countries, including all the most uh, powerful um, uh, players in, in, in our global geopolitics, would be to empower the UN to meaningfully advance uh, disarmament globally um, when convening multilateral negotiations and agreements among member states. You know, the Non-Proliferation Treaty has an article, Article 6, which actually calls for nuclear disarmament. Um, countries are already committed to this principle, and yet, you know, we're going, of course, in the exactly the opposite direction. Uh, countries are building up their arsenals and and expanding their 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 uh, nuclear weapon systems um, at great cost. In, incidentally, we are spending close to hundred billion dollars per year doing this, which runs counter to the letter and the spirit of the Non Proliferation Treaty. If we were to give the United Nations enhanced uh, um, authority. Um, this would this would be very very helpful, you know, to create a conducive environment for sustained progress on nuclear disarmament and reductions of, of proliferations and other weapon systems, um, especially in the context of the developments that are taking place on the artificial intelligence side. You know, this is a very very concerning concerning area of work. And uh, I, I am somewhat alarmed that more and more uh, political scientists, people with sterling uh, academic reputations, I'm thinking of people like Professor Dan Daniel Dudney at John Hopkins University, are increasingly speaking of the possibility of, you know, the actual use of nuclear weapons in a World War III kind of scenario. And the third area... Um, it basically has to do with with you know all uh, sort of the, the the whole space that i would broadly bring under the umbrella of economic and social development the un charter recognizes economic and social development as a responsibility of the international community but despite progress in recent decades uh, which is undeniable we still have you know many outstanding unresolved issues uh, According to the World Bank, uh, sustainable development goal number one, which is the elimination of extreme poverty, is out of reach. Uh, you know, this is the foundation of the sustainable development goals, and it is not going to happen um, because of COVID in the first instance and because of the ramifications of the war in the Ukraine. Uh, um, the latest forecast that I have seen from the World Bank is something like 600 million extremely poor people by 2030, which, of, which is, of course, sad because it represents a setback with respect to the very sustained progress that happened between 1990 and 2019. Um, we have a $100 trillion economy with the highest productive capacity in the history of mankind, as far as we know. And yet this coexists with you know 800 million mal malnourished people in the world. Um, uh, which I think it's, it, it raises fundamental questions about the adequacy of our economic paradigm. 
Um, income disparities are widening. This is well known. I don't I don't have the time uh, because I'm coming to the to my time limit to, to share with you um, you know all the various statistics that are often quoted in the media about uh, you know the, the this widening income disparities and 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 the political consequences that income inequality is beginning to have in the world. It's no longer just a, an economic and social problem. It's a political problem as well, and I think it's undermining the basis of democracy in many parts of the world, including in places you know like the United States, you know that have long traditions of democratic institutions and democratic forms of governance. Um, we have a persistent problem of massive violations of human rights. You know. The overwhelming majority of countries have endorsed the principles of the Universal Declaration, and yet we have countries like Iran, uh, where half of the population, its women, are discriminated against. At uh, the World Bank, we put together a database that shows that in Iran there are 24 different forms of discrimination where the laws of the country basically make women second-class citizens. And of course, Iran also discriminates actively against religious minorities, including the Baha'i community, which is the largest religious minority in the country, and so on. So we have these unresolved issues, and we need to, we need to address them in a, in, a, in, a, in a fundamental way. We need to have a foundation of international law for many of these problems, you know, to, to, to become... Um, um, sort of to, to 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 turn into solutions that that can bring um, a happier, more prosperous, more stable life to our human family. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lopez Claros. Uh, very interesting three points and some other points that uh, I'd like to rebound on uh, uh, after all the uh, prepared statements. I now have the pleasure of asking Dr. Isabella Bunn to uh, take the floor or, or take charge of the screen, if you will, please. Thank you very much. And I'm joining you from Washington, DC with constant reminders about the questions at hand for human security and also rule of law questions, which is in particular what I would like to focus on as an international lawyer. So what is the rule of law? Perhaps I might begin with a definition because I know we have many different disciplines uh, with us today. And I think that is one of the great strengths of the World Academy. It is a uh, multifaceted principle that contributes to good governance and of course sustains our favorable political and economic conditions. The well-cited definition that all lawyers begin with is one from renowned jurist Tom Bingham who said that the core principle of the rule of law is, quote, all persons and authorities within the state, whether public or private, should be bound by and entitled to the benefit of laws publicly and prospectively promulgated and publicly administered in the courts. So this is a def definition that does form a foundational understanding of why the rule of law is important. And you can see it, I think, within the deliberations over the next few days that it is really going to be a cross-cutting theme that supports many of the objectives that the world community through its multilateral system is trying to promote uh, all the way down to the local level. And of course, um, across the many jurisdictions that are represented here uh, within the World Academy. Um, I would like to make just maybe uh, three brief points. We're focusing on solutions and strategies. So I wanted to be a little bit practical. Uh, with this difficult and complex far-reaching concept. But I think one uh, benefit of focusing on the rule of law is really looking for the strategic interconnections with other ideas. And one of those ideas that I found particularly uh, compelling is the one of positive peace. Uh, you may be familiar with this uh, development over the years within peace studies, but also through the uh, Institute for Economics and Peace. And really the notion is that peace is absolutely essential to human flourishing. It's the foundation of thriving societies and economies. And it certainly encompasses far more than just the absence of conflict. So those complex dynamics are not what we're gonna be talking about here, but really rather this positive approach um, affirming the vital role of peace in the SDGs and just societies and for, so forth. But in particular, I was always struck by how that principle of positive peace 
um, essentially the framework, the pillars that they've developed reinforce everything that we're talking about today and also obviously have a, a synergy with the whole question uh, before us in looking at these uh, questions of rule of law and far beyond. So those eight pillars of positive peace include well-functioning government, two, sound business environment, ex three, acceptance of the rights of others, good relations with neighbors, free flow of information, high levels of human capital, low levels of corruption, and equitable distribution of resources. So I think that this is one powerful interconnection that can be um, forged in thinking through um, the benefits of uh, rule of law foundations in this discourse, of course, also including human security. Um, the other idea is one of political and economic freedom. This notion of freedom being expressed often in terms of individual rights and responsibilities that shape in turn the political and economic order. And that in turn underpins the exercise of our various rights and liberty. But I think also more broadly, we can see how that process of mutual reinforcement is something that really sustains the foundation for freedom, uh, justice, and uh, peace, but also democracy. And certainly you can hear within this echoes of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the foundations of human dignity. The second uh, interconnection that I always see with this question of rule of law, accountable institutions. So the need for these institutions, and of course these are both formal and informal, um, show that you need to have at every level of society notions of transparency and decision making, for example, um, which is key to countering corruption. Um, another attribute being inclusiveness, where people can access economic opportunity and public services uh, in an equitable manner. And of course, the effectiveness of both national and international outcome. Um, and I think I see within this, and, and you can certainly see also this theme of trust, that these accountable institutions help build a culture of trust. And then the um, other aspect, of course, is one of accountability more uh, generally, um, the need for accountable institutions. And again, this ties into equity and also anti-corruption. So positive peace, political economy, and accountability. Another major theme that we can see as an overarching momentum building process is of course, leveraging SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. And we've all seen how this has created new collaborations, new discourse, new research, new policies, literally at every level of society. And of course, it's a priority also for the United Nations as just described with the whole SDG process and monitoring its progress, but also seeing how SDG 16, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a lawyer, really foundational to the achievement of all the other goals. So I think it's important to think of SDG 16 as an accelerator, not just a foundation, but really an accelerator for the entire SDG agenda. If there is an erosion in that SDG 16 objective, there's gonna be a erosion in the achievement of all the other goals and vice versa. That's the good news is that if we support strong, just institutions, inclusive economies and peace, we will see those dividends in all of the other SDGs. Um, the other element, a third one perhaps that we should um, mention in this context of SDG 16 in particular, of course, we've seen the private sector move toward uh, corporate responsibility in all sorts of ways, whether it's environmental, whether it's human rights, whether it's anti-corruption and so forth. And one of those main drivers has been the United Nations and its global compact, as you know, with its 10 principles. So one of the interesting projects I've been in involved with as an external advisor is with the United Nations Global Compact on a project called Transformational Governance. And the aim is to really invite the private sector to participate much more fully in this particular goal and look to both their internal governance practices and their external practices in the operating environments in which they have business activities to consider also how they might strengthen those operating environments, which of course is good for civil society, it's good for um, the local economy, it's good for creating uh, improved value chains, it's good for minimizing risk, 
Um, so there's really a win-win situation that the operating environment is enhanced, people have more inclusive and prosperous economies, and also that the corporations themselves have a key role to play in this and a strong interest in maintaining that peace and stability, which of course is essential to everything else they want to achieve, whether that's an economic objective or a social objective. Um, finally, this notion of reinforcing justice. I think this is a theme that, again, is so multifaceted, and it seems like, again, it cuts through all of our conversation pieces. And you can see how that reinforcement of justice, the climate justice transition process is certainly one key element. Human rights and human security represents another aspect of justice in this context. There's also a, main, a major movement now among civil society and international institutions to focus on people-centered justice. That brings us back to the humanity that underlines the World uh, Academy, of course, and its principles, and of course, the human security aspect. And finally, in terms of reinforcing justice, uh, we have a whole new territory where we need to apply these questions, which is the virtual technological AI space. There are countless questions about justice being raised right now. And I think it's important for the people on this call to start thinking through in their personal lives, in their business activities, both the tremendous benefits and advantages of this process of the, the technologies and the new platforms, but also the enhanced risks that they can create. And it ties right back into the governance question that underlies this broader conversation that we're having today. How can AI and technology support good governance? And also we have to be wary with the AI and artificial uh, intelligence capacity to manipulate information and use that also as a political tool and an economic tool that we have to be very vigilant. And I think this is where we have to put the best collaborative minds together as we think about the questions that we're thinking about today, about rule of law, about SDG 16, about leveraging justice, about new forms of collaboration, new forms of research. This needs to be a priority right now that really is demanding questions, but also can provide a lot of answers. So let me just also point out one of the advantages of AI in the space of rule of law will be enhanced uh, opportunities to both understand the rule of law dynamics and to measure their benefits and their impact. And I wanna close just by also suggesting to you that the World Justice Project that you may be familiar with uh, issues an annual World Justice Index and ranks entire countries by their level of rule of law performance. And what's interesting, it's interesting to see the rankings, of course, we're all attracted by lists and numbers and rankings, but there's also a mechanism because it's all very empirically driven and technologically rigorous. There's a mechanism to understand where the weaknesses are. And obviously some countries get upset when they see that they're dropping in the rankings and they argue about that. But the positive framing is that you can see where the shortcomings are and that level of matrix and data can identify areas for reform and for uh, activity that would enhance the rule of law and then hence everything that we're talking about in today's uh, conversation about SDGs, about justice, about peace and the broader human security questions, also the multilateral order. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bunn. Uh, thank you for this excellent unpacking of governance and uh, identifying some of the key issues, which I hope to get back to um, uh, in the course of the discussion, which I still hope to have. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, the Reverend Dr. Liberato Bautista, uh, who is the president of Congo. This is the um, <clears throat> conference of uh, non-governmental organizations in consultative uh, relationship with the United Nations. Um, it's interesting to note that in the 75 years of Congo, Dr. Bautista is the only Congo president to be elected to serve for an unprecedented third term and will serve his current term until 2025. He has, uh, like all of you, a very rich uh, background and uh, unfortunately, I cannot go into all of it at this time, uh, but to say that uh, Dr. Bautista uh, currently serves as the main representative to the United Nations for the United Methodist Church General Board of Church and Society, uh, the International Public Policy and Social Justice Agency 
of the United Methodist uh, Church. It is my pleasure to ask you to address the session. And I remember, I think we were together in the uh, WAAS at 60. Um, so it's good to see you again. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, David. In fact, the last uh, time we saw each other was in Baku at the, right. World, at the World Political Forum. Great to see many friends here uh, on the same, on another platform that's organized by the World Academy. It's an honor. I, I have just returned from the 2024 United Nations Civil Society Conference, which was held in Nairobi. I thought I would see Maria Fernanda here. We were there in Nairobi. It's just uh, less than 72 hours ago that I arrived back to the US. Uh, Congo, uh, or the Conference of NGOs, was one of the four major civil society networks that coordinated the conference under the auspices of the United Nations Department of Global Communications. It had more than 2,000 registered participants, and Maria Fernanda was a moderator in one of the plenary sessions and contributor to the substantive aspects of this conference, which was conceived to support the Summit of the Future. In fact, the program was built around workshops and impact coalitions that addressed the five sections of the zero draft of the Pact for the Future. Now, I do not intend to speak too much to the zero draft of the Pact for the Future as an earlier panel uh, addressed this uh, today. Uh, but I want to add that the robust participation of civil society in its broadest sense, NGOs, civil society organizations, and critical social movements on the ground uh, were present in Nairobi and made possible the broad and diverse proposals to improve the outcome document of the Summit of the Future, which is called the Pact for the Future. The conference in interacted with all of the four co-facilitators of the Summit of the Future and that of the Global Digital Compact and Dr. Ban's uh, description of, of the of, of artificial intelligence and information communication technology is apt and, and, and fitting to be discussed in any proposal for a just, peaceable, sustainable, and inclusive future. And so uh, I assert the, the importance of civil society participation in the crafting of international and intergovernmental agreements, especially on ones that are about the future, their future, if not the futures of both people and the planet. Civil society participation in Nairobi demonstrated how civil society representatives can contribute substantively to matters of local, national, regional, and global governance. I, I, I am sure you agree with when I say that civil society is elemental in the realization of peace, democracy, and the rule of law, and indeed, in making multilateralism alive, not just in the texts that intergovernmental processes produce, but in deeds that we the peoples uh, must do. At Congo, we call this civil society engagement as access to the premises and the promises of the multilateral system, access to the substantive agenda, indeed the premises of the UN, is as important as access to the physical premises in which discussion and policy making occur. This is key to ensuring the buy-in of we the peoples to the multilateral agenda. This leads me to my second point, which Nairobi's discussions were ample about, be they at the plenary podium, at conference workshops or impact coalition launchings, that we are in a world with acute global perils. Now this, phrase is used in the chapeau of the zero draft of the pact for the future. We are a world in acute global perils. These acute global perils are endangering the present and imperiling the future. Among them are poverty, hunger, inequality, armed conflicts, violence, displacement, terrorism, climate change, disease, and the adverse impacts of technology. Now that listing is what the Chapeau uh, included. 
while the Pact for the Future acknowledges poverty as a significant barrier to achieving the SDGs, the Shapo and other sections fail to address the substantial drain on resources to fund social safety nets to address hunger and poverty. And this will not augur well. Indeed, it will disappoint the peoples of the world, world, the ordinary citizens, because what matters to them with SDGs or not is the eradication of hunger and the elimination of poverty itself. And wars have been launched. Conflicts have festered precisely because hunger and, and poverty have lingered far too long. And the rule of law is, is tends to be set aside uh, in pursuit of and by way, whatever means uh, the the uh, the overcoming of poverty and of hunger, and democracy itself can be compromised and multilateralism rendered inutile, including its negotiated texts, unless the root causes of war and of undemocratic processes uh, are are uh, taken care of all because they have not released and harnessed the social energies of individuals and organizations to enhance peace, democracy, the rule of law, and multilateralism about which this panel is, is exploring. Part of the disappointment, indeed discontent that breeds unpeace and injustice lies in the same commitment in texts and in deeds uh, having to do with the puny and muted commitment of the multilateral processes to fund peace and peace building. Such funding of the implements of peace prepares the fertile grounds for the practice of democracy and the flourishing of the rule of law. Here, budgets for peace building, enhancing democracy, developing norms and standards for the rule of law and multilateralism itself are key. In Nairobi, in one of my interventions, I said budgets are moral documents. As such, they indicate the priorities of governments and multilateral institutions. We need multilateral texts that demonstrate commitment of national and global coffers, their budgets, to fund the elimination of hunger and the eradication of poverty. But herein lies the rub. While the Pact of the Future mentions the scourge of war, it shies away from addressing defense spending and the full throttle funding of wars and conflicts that are imperiling international order, giving way to the flaunting of the rule of law, indeed of international law, and undermining the UN Charter and its pillars of development, peace and security, and human rights itself. And so I asked, in Nairobi, and I, I post the question as well here. If the war on poverty is indeed a war, why does it not receive the same level of funding as other wars? Welfare and social justice, not warfare, was loud and clearly sounded in Nairobi. This panel, as all other venues of global governance, must hear that plea. It is a plea for the rule of law, of international law, it was civil society's way of imagining the world and a future without wars and the reduction of their funding, including the development of new and current war implements. To this, our academy, the World Academy of Art and Science has amply addressed the importance of turning national security into human security. The multilateral, uh, and let me end uh, with this a few more uh, sentences. The multilateral system has a vast arsenal of diplomatic tools and implements for sustainable development that can and must protect the human body from health pandemics and the body politic from social inequalities that will enhance yet again the very concern of this panel, peace, democracy, the rule of law, and multilateralism. That body politic I referred to must be inclusive, gender just, and affirmative. It must also be intentionally intergenerational, including youth and indigenous peoples whose futures and existence are at stake. This is a prerequisite for democracy, participatory democracies that is just, peaceable, and inclusive. 
this too is a prerequisite to our obligation to avoid imperiling the needs of the present and not compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. That is multilateralism's primordial task as far as I'm concerned. Participatory democracy must be undergirded by our understanding that human rights and gender equality are co-constitutive of democracy as much as the rule of law. Multilateralism must pay attention to the lingering inequalities because of our historic past. And I quote Guterres's address in Nairobi, the historic past of slavery, colonialism, racism, and add here sexism. The roots of these inequalities have perpetuated an uneven development of economies that makes multilateralism's ambitions for sustainable development harder to accomplish. Friends, a strategy that this panel must prosper is a strategy that is life enhancing and death reducing. What do I mean? Jonathan Larson's Broadway musical Rent has this famous lyric and I quote, the opposite of war is not peace, it is creation. Creation is life-giving. Anything that diminishes and curtails creation spells death. The eradication of hunger and elimination of poverty, indeed the ground for true peace and democracy is life enhancing. That should be multilateralism's true cause. And addressing this cause must be in pursuit of reversing the surfeit of fear to favor the increase of hope in our world today. Thank you, dear friends. I end it here. Thank you very much, Liberato. Thank you. Uh, you raise a very important point about war on poverty not being funded as, uh, among many other points, an access of civil society. Your quote with which you finished reminded me of another quote from a, a folk song in the 50s uh, of a U.S. Uh, folk group uh, where the wording uh, was, uh, why is it that the worst of men must fight, but the best of men must die? Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, last, but by no means least, Dr. Saulo Casali Bahia, uh, who is a federal judge in Brazil and member of the Faculty of Law of the Federal University of Bahia uh, in Salvador, Brazil. He has extensive experience in uh, constitutional law and public international law and in public policies and judicial power. A member of the editorial board of three journals, Dr. Bahia has published many books and articles, as most of you have, and is a recipient of several awards. He's been visiting professor at the University of Florida and in France, University of Tours. He's a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science since 2006, and a trustee since 2012. Dr. Bahia works to raise the Academy's impact and visibility as we all try to do. Some succeed more than others. Uh, Dr. Bahia, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. David. I'm talking from Brazil, from Salvador in South America. I will try to, to use only seven minutes. When I, I, I was uh, put inside this, this panel to talk about democracy, peace, rule of law, multilateralism, I understood that I could uh, deal with, uh, bring uh, a problem that I think that is global nowadays uh, regarding democracy and, and we can discuss some ideas about it. Let me start with my vision about the human relationship and human communication nowadays. I can say that they are mediated by social media nowadays. If you think about uh, WhatsApp, 2 billion users in the world. Uh, if you think about WhatsApp in Brazil, 80% of the population use WhatsApp, use WhatsApp. And we chat in China, uh, China is what we shed to 1,3 billion users, Facebook about 1 billion users. So the importance, the weight, the, the role of the social platforms are, are growing up and the traditional media is going, uh, his, its power lower and lower uh, nowadays. And um, at the first moment, 
when we arrived with this, this when appear uh, the social platforms, we we said yes, cyber activism. We had a lot of expectation of greater popular and citizen participation, growth of democracy. We saw the air, we spring, the rising of the digital power. We suppose a dialogical character of interaction, power to the people, intensification of communication. Castells talked about the mass auto communication, but uh, we are looking only at a quantitative prism, but we we insisted to to say about uh, to talk about the information super highway. We believe in virtuous results, decentralization of communication, with analogy with the Protestant Reformation. Now the citizen has power, the people has power. Cyberspace as a new agora, uh, that direct democracy. And even uh, we, we, we had the, the declaration of cyberspace and independence, John Berlow, governments of the industrial world, you were giants of flesh and steel. I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind on behalf of the future. I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. Uh, you have no sovereignty where we gather. So we we are very very uh, ambitious with this first moment of uh, of uh, social platforms. But at, in a second moment, we discovered that more access is not better information. Formation we 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 saw a formation of vertical communication chains for inferences, control and manipulation. The content production and reproduction are automated. We, we experience uh, actually a fragmentation of the public sphere and debate. Uh, we, at the first moment, we didn't see, but now we can perceive that the information has perceptible wallet path. Uh, we, there is a false impression of neutrality and free flow of information, but now we started to verify that uh, there is no neutrality in this field of social media. Uh, and uh, we verified that this heterogeneous group was transformed into a smaller homogeneous groups with limited access to content we verified the uh, bubbles, echo chambers, clusters of people with the same values. And uh, contrary ideas are repealed and fragmentation of opinions and polarization is generated. So we can, we can see our age of extremism, far right movement, territory or opportunity, and all kind of extremism, all kind of extreme nationalism, xenophobia, etc. So the disinformation, the debate and consensus, the social, con the public consensus emptying. Uh, Oxford published a report that industrialized disinformation. It's very interesting, this report. No new information circulating is circulating, uh, but there is a reinforcement of already known uh, emotions. We, the, what happened with social, social uh, platforms? What happened with uh, artificial intelligence? Uh, artificial intelligence as social platform reinforce existing standards and prejudice. Why? Uh, it uh, creates a unilateral character of communication. The political thought becomes associative and affective. No information circulates, but emotion intensifies feelings and makes uh, rational scrutiny disappear. Platforms are not information intermediaries they determine the content of the information. Zuckerberg, in his speech to the American Congress in April uh, 2018, told that 
So uh, what, what happened? What, why uh, reasons, strategies for that? First of all, engagement. Social platforms must uh, acquire engagement from the users. So they will do the best to put to, to, to kidnap the individual, the citizen, uh, to put him in using the, the, the platform. Uh, the algorithm are not neutral, and uh, the content will, will be specific for uh, the interest of the individual. So the profiling technique is, is used. The botnets create an illusion of broad support for the idea, astroturfing. We saw that uh, some, uh, some debates are in, in, entirely artificial nowadays. Fire hose and technique, an immense volume of messages sent with a continuous and repetitive quick rate to create the illusion of credibility of the generated content. We saw that all the time all the time, disturbing uh, the debate, uh, disturbing the information, disturbing the comprehension of the world, the comprehension of the reality. We have another, another kind of reality. And they, they use it even, uh, they discover the possibility to use uh, the, the fact that our rationality has bounds. Uh, heuristics, resolutive shortcuts to facilitate decision making, they use a lot in social platforms. Kahneman told about that, right, wrote about that in, in his book uh, uh, and uh, talked about the system one, automatic emotion, system two, rational. And so we use confirmatory bias. We tend to confirm initial position, the topic, uh, encourage bias, initial information, even with a relation to following influences, decisions, framing effect, the way in which options are present, influence, choices, cognitive illusions, deviation from rationality. I'm finished already. The use of confirmation bias, information appears as truth and validate identity. There is a complete invisibility of programming actors, the political advisors, uh, artificial intelligence uh, expert, scientists, posters, gatekeepers, and spin doctors. Uh, M. Pauli told about, wrote about that in, when he wrote about uh, the chaos engineers in politics. Spin doctor is someone who is skilled in public relations and who advises political parties to on how to present their policies and actions. Gatekeeper, we know already the, the, the meaning. And uh, in the third moment, the solution, we need uh, a crisis of democracy after this kind of uh, interferences, this reality, this fact. Uh, so I believe that, I strongly believe that uh, moderation of social platforms, of social media is absolutely necessary. We need uh, the moderation by the law, by international treaties, by international, with the efforts of, from international organizations, uh, NGOs, society, we need more transparency, we need uh, explainable algorithms, able to inspire confidence, respect for ethics, human rights, democratic values and diversity, reliability and responsibility. In March of this year, Brazilian Supreme Court deter determined the complete and suspension of the, the operation of Telegram in Brazil. And to the messaging application, messaging application complied with court decisions, and the, the, there was uh, the, the, uh, some uh, engineers of chaos uh, started to create another kind of debate, uh, and the problem was freedom of speech, and the, and the, the debate was impersonal, and the, the dimension was completely. Uh, deviate and uh, at least uh, prohibition of the use of social boats fire hosing astroturfing and i believe that this kind of uh, fact that we saw nowadays uh, is 
a real challenge for democracy. And uh, we need uh, an effort, uh, a joint effort to, to uh, from United Nations, from the, 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 the the countries, organizations to try to, to do something to, to save our perception of reality that you are losing with the virtual world and the virtual glasses. And it's my contribution today. Thank you, our, our moderator. Thank you. And thank you for you your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Baia. Thank you uh, to everybody. We have about 15 minutes left for a, a quick discussion, um, about 15 minutes less than I had uh, wanted, but uh, uh, you were presenting, making such interesting presentations. I didn't have the heart to stop any of you. Um, and uh, Dr. Baia, thank you for bringing up the uh, this whole issue, uh, which uh, complicates all the problems that we've been talking about. On top of that, we now have um, things happening that are totally distorting reality. And so it has to be a factor that's taken into account. Uh, let me um, get back to uh, something uh, uh, that uh, Dr. Lopez Claros uh, mentioned. Nothing in particular, and I'm not picking on, on you or uh, on uh, something you said, I just uh, want to uh, rebound on terminology. Um, terminology, you quite rightly said that uh, global institutions are not able to uh, adapt to the new uh, global governance gap, etc. cetera. Um, also to empower the UN to promote disarmament. Um, I've often uh, argued that uh, we need to probably, and this is what I would like to ask you to do, to drill down a little bit in those terms, uh, we need to speak in more, uh, I think, concrete terms because the United Nations is many things. So when we say the United Nations need or has succeeded in something or has failed in something, we need to identify which United Nations we're talking about. We're talking about the General Assembly. We're talking about the uh, United Nations system. Are we talking about the Security Council? Are we talking about the five permanent members of the Security Council? Uh, the same way, um, you know, global institutions, uh, they're not, uh, they are in inanimate objects. The global institutions are made up of representatives of member states. How would you, so we understand the problem, uh, I think, but how would you, uh, try to take us a step forward and and uh, make or induce those who make up these global institutions that are not entities unto themselves as the UN isn't. How do we make the member states um, change that? How do we make them empower uh, disarmament, empower the UN uh, to, to empower disarmament? When as you rightly pointed out, and I did as well, uh, disarmament has been all but tossed aside and lying uh, you know, decrepit on the side of the road. How would you uh, drill down and what kind of specific um, recommendations could we come up with our panel on this? Um, thank you very much, um, David, for this opportunity. I would I would like to make two points. I think that one of the problem with the UN system is that, as you know, the, the, the UN Charter, which is the foundation of the global governance architecture that came out of World War II, has never been uh, modernized. It has never been amended. Uh, it's still operating under the same kinds of principles that we that were adopted in 1945. And a lot of those are uh, no longer adequate. Um, the world has moved on. We have problems today which uh, are a threat to our future, uh, which are not, not mentioned in the UN Charter. Try to find the word environment or climate in the UN Charter of 1945, and it'll, 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 you, you will not succeed, right? So one aspect of the solution has to be to begin thinking about how would we wish to 
modernize and update the UN Charter so that we bring the UN system, broadly defined, into the 21st century. But that, to me, is a, a vitally important question. And I'd just like to say that the Global Governance Forum has actually set up a group of experts, um, including uh, people like Maria Fernandez Spinoza, Jody Williams, and, and Andrew Strauss, and, and many others, who are working on this. On this. Uh, we issued a paper last September making the case for revising the UN Charter. And this September in New York, we hope to, to release a copy of what a, a revised UN Charter could look like uh, to begin a conversation around these issues. In this respect, um, I, I like to say that I very much welcome the remarks by Dr. Bautista. And I so much hope that the Pact for the Future would actually endorse the idea of calling for an Article 109 conference where we can begin to have that conversation. The UN Charter envisages the possibility of having a conversation around amending the UN Charter. It has never taken place. Uh, it, it's uh, unfortunately dead letter. Um, the, the, in order to make the summit of the future a more meaningful opportunity to generate uh, uh, reforms, calling for an Article 109 conference would be a very, very important achievement. The second point, just very briefly, you know, I derive some encouragement from the fact that the 27 member nations of the European Union have actually already for several decades created an infrastructure, an institutional infrastructure where they are doing binding laws, um, you know, with it for the member for the member states. Environmental policy is is done not in the capitals, it is done in Brussels. Of course, all the countries are represented, they all participate in the debate. The European Union has a European Court of Justice. It has a parliament with substantial powers. It has a European Central Bank. Uh, it has an executive in, in the commission. In other words, when we talk about moving to a world in which uh, we create a UN system that is able to have the appropriate jurisdiction, the resources, and the capacity to deal with these global problems, we're not speaking in a vacuum. We have the experience of the European Union. They have set the, the, uh, an example for us. And, and I think that that is one um, way in which we could move in that direction across the whole range of issues which I mentioned, from disarmament to you know, poverty and inequality and so on. Let me just give you one example. The UN system at the moment is going through a huge budgetary crisis. It is, you know, we have great expectations about the UN and we don't give the organization the resources that it needs. The European Union decades ago came up with a system of funding itself independently of the political process. It doesn't depend on the goodwill of its uh, prime ministers and governments. It automatically generates a body of resources because within European law, a share of value-added uh, value taxes and import duties are directly channeled to the, to the European budget, which allows the organization to plan to do budgeting over a six-year period, and you know to have a reliable source of income, which the UN does not does not have. So, I I would like to mention that as a as a potentially very useful model for uh, the UN in the future. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, you're absolutely right, but it begs the question: Why can't those same member states apply these, or at least present these? They don't want to do that in the UN context. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, having a, a group of like-minded countries, basically um, not a very large group compared to the rest of the world, is a good beginning, but it, it will need a lot of work, I think, to transpose it to the rest of the world. But, uh, I mean, tell me about the financial problem I just heard I, I, I retired from the UN, but I just heard from a colleague that uh, now you cannot come into the UN building in Geneva before 8 a.m. and you have to leave at 7.30. At 7.15, they make an announcement like they do at shopping malls. That, Dear customers, the mall will be closing in 15 minutes, so take your uh, stuff to the cashier, something like that. Um, I'd like to, uh, um, but on the, uh, on the uh, charter, um, Look, you, you're preaching to the converted as far as I'm concerned, but, uh, and it needs changing, and most definitely two things need changing, I think, in my mind, which is one is uh, 
the elimination of the term enemy states, and the other is the uh, the uh, uh, elimination of the principle of unanimity of the five permanent members, which is the veto power, which in my view is the crux of the problem. But then that raises the issue that if if that is to be um, eliminated, who is going to give up their veto? They will not vote for it. So it has to be the General Assembly to pull rank. And then we need a general conference, as you had just suggested. But um, it, it raises the larger question that this organization does, in fact, unfortunately, belong to these five member states. And they run it through the Secretary General, which is, who is beholden to them. And so if we raise the issue of, of getting rid of the veto, then they will uh, start evaluating whether the, the organization has any value for them. And that'll be, uh, you know, there goes the neighborhood. So I think that's why. And the, the last thing on the charter, I think, um, I am really, uh, really skeptical as to, as you said, what will the charter look like at the end of this process? In this uh, environment, with this, as Dr. Bunn uh, rightly pointed out, the issue of trust, she pointed this out from the uh, from the uh, uh, justice uh, from, from, you know, from the uh, issue of, of, of the legal side. But trust is at it's such a deficit. How can we expect to reopen the charter, and then how to close it? And how big is it going to be? Like the budget that Ronald Reagan once brought into Congress that was humongous. So uh, lots of issues there. I don't I, you know, want to get into an argument or anything. I don't think we have an argument. But um, uh, there was another issue that was raised by many, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Bunn raised the issue of uh, AI as a, as, a, as a justice issue. But there are many other issues. And it also uh, harks back to the, the, the technology issue raised by Dr. Bahia and also to the governance issue, which you raised um, and, uh, and, and you all raised, uh, because we now often hear that, uh, yes, AI is terrific, uh, but it has its dark sides, uh, but let's uh, entrust the UN to govern it. Well, my immediate reaction uh, is, A, which part of the UN? And since I insist that the UN is made up of member states and it doesn't exist as a, as a separate body, will that uh, assignment go the same direction as every other uh, UN effort where the member states will be at loggerheads, they will have the politics uh, get involved in this, uh, they will not be able to come up with a governance structure, and who will be blamed? The UN, this anonymous UN. Uh, and we'll get another black eye. Uh, anybody, I'm, I'm asking for, for anybody to comment on this, whether am I, am I missing the point here or is there something to what I, what I uh, just um, alluded to? We only have uh, uh, five minutes left. So whoever is brave wants to take a swing at this. Let me make a quick response, David, but particularly on what Dr. Ban uh, addressed as well on uh, digital justice. And I, I think, you know, the a month ago, Congo organized a panel on the side of the uh, uh, meeting in Bangkok of uh, the uh, Economic and Social Council for Asia Pacific. And it has to do, and the title was quite uh, interesting. It was AI colon artificial, but real. Uh, and and th 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 the discussion was about the fact that it is real in terms of the UN's effort to digitize knowledge, digitize current and available information, as well as digitalize knowledge. And my example to you, and that's a, a matter of justice, is question uh, are, is a question raised by the indigenous communities. UNESCO is currently an aggressively digitalizing indigenous knowledge. And the indigenous elders ask, when will, can you guarantee us in the future that we will have access 
to our own narratives. We don't have electricity in the reservations. We don't have laptop. We don't have access to internet. You are documenting our life and livelihoods and everything that is dear to us. Will we have in the future access to it? And I think that's to me is the justice issue and and the declaration on the global uh, on uh, on a global digital compact must address that. Thank you very much, Liberato. But uh, Baye, with regard to what you were saying, it's all uh, rooted in technology and uh, it's many possible misuses, which we already have. Actually, speaking of previous uh, statements, I made a statement uh, in a conference in uh, in Istanbul last March, and I called uh, my, uh, my, my statement... Uh, bracing ourselves for AI in the absence of multilateralism. Please uh, share, share it with us, please. Sure. Um, but uh, would you like to speak to that, uh, especially in light of the fact that uh, technology is already uh, serving us badly by creating this universe of echo chambers and false information and fakes, etc., and deep fakes when you can't even tell whether it's uh, it's the real person or or not, uh, how do we how do we uh, uh, you know uh, address this in a world where we still haven't it's all gone now but we still uh, we never uh, rather we never came up with a protocol to regulate the faxes uh, which were being sent anywhere there was a fax machine there was no protocol how do we uh, brace ourselves for this. Yes, I believe that transparency is the, the will be the will be the rule. Transparency, access, control, possibility of control, liability. It's all that uh, the UNESCO principles uh, uh, said. It's all that the all the efforts the White Book in Europe are, are dealing with this kind of solution. Oh, the, the the national regulations are always talking about uh, transparency, liability, uh, access to algorithms, because uh, the dangers are are uh, are actually enormous, and we are, we can see that the interferences in in situations of peace, situations of uh, democracy, uh, and uh, even uh, politics. Oh, and uh, we, we, we need to pay attention. I believe that the world is starting to pay more and more attention over the, this global issue. It's very important. Thank you very much. There's a, a whole number of issues that we could discuss, but uh, we are actually pretty good. Uh, we arrived at uh, 6.15 right on time, and I don't want to uh, spoil that uh, result. So I want to thank all of you for uh, outstanding presentations, for very interesting um, uh, issues raised and some practical things that uh, uh, we discussed. And in closing, I'd like to thank the excellent uh, Academy staff who are usually the unsung heroes behind our meetings and who make all this happen. And, uh, and thank you very much.